How does cancer affect the nervous system? Can neurons communicate with cancer tumor cells? Can tumor cells communicate with neurons? And if so, how does the nervous system affect the progression and development of cancer? Welcome back to NeuroPsyQ. Thanks for joining us for another week's video. Today, we are going to be talking about the emerging field of cancer neuroscience. Remember, there is a quiz down below, so if you're paying attention throughout the video and you want to test your knowledge later, make sure you click the link to the quiz. But for now, let's get started. Before we dive into the depths of cancer neuroscience, I just want to maybe review for some of you or introduce different types of signaling that occurs within our body. Now, signaling in our body is very important because in order for one cell to progress into a system of cells, which then progresses into us as humans, these cells must be able to interact and communicate. So there's three main types of signaling that allow cells to communicate. Autocrine signaling is where a cell just communicates with itself. And so what this is, is when a cell is releasing signaling molecules into the environment that bind to its own receptors. So this can allow the cell to learn things about itself. Paracrine signaling is when nearby cells interact with each other. So ones that aren't very far apart would release molecules into the environment. Those molecules can bind to another cell nearby and they can learn about the cells around them. Finally, we have endocrine signaling, which is sometimes referred to as systemic signaling. This signaling happens across the body. So this would be when molecules are released and perhaps enter the bloodstream and travel long distances to send signals to other cells in different systems. So now that we've gone over that and you understand the types of signaling within the body, we can start to chip away at the facts that we know which are revealing a new field of cancer neuroscience. Interestingly, we are seeing interactions between the nervous system and cancer pathogenesis. The nervous system we know already influences development, homeostasis, plasticity, and regeneration, but whether or not it influences cancer is something that we're looking into. And if it can influence the formation and progression of cancer, that's something we want to know to help us develop future treatments. Now, we are starting to uncover something called nervous system cancer crosstalk, which is when the nervous system cells or neurons and also glial cells have been seen to communicate with cancer cells via receptor-mediated signaling. This is happening systemically, but also it's happening within the tumor microenvironment. Not too long ago, there was the Banbury meeting, which was held on December 10th to December 13th in 2019. This is when people from the neuroscience and cancer biology community united to discuss this emerging field. And out of this meeting came the roadmap to the emerging field of cancer neuroscience. So they have seen that the nervous system can actually control and mediate cancer progression and formation. Now, just a reminder, the nervous system extends throughout the whole body. We're not just referring to the central nervous system, we also have the peripheral nervous system, which is the nerves that extend all the way to your fingertips and allow you to have sensations there as well as the ones that extend to your gut to help with gustatory reflexes, which is just digestion. The bottom line is almost every part of the body is innervated. So the recent discovery that neural cells can influence cancer cells was a huge breakthrough. In the central nervous system, we've seen these glutamatergic cells, which are typically thought to be excitatory cells that drive glial precursor proliferation. Normally these cells will promote the proliferation of glial cells. An experimental model, however, has shown 
that this same signaling pathway can drive glioma growth. Now, the two types of signaling that have been seen to possibly mediate this communication are electrochemical signaling, which is the same type of signal that allows our neurons to carry sensory information to our brain. It's the same type of signal that allows our neurons to communicate with each other. It's basically the signal that triggers an action potential. We've also seen paracrine signaling, which isn't electrochemical, but rather with some sort of signaling molecule binding to a receptor. One example of paracrine signaling could be the fact that neurons release growth factors which may be promoting glioma expression. These malignant cells can actually also integrate into circuits and each malignant cell is coupled to the next with gap junctions creating this interconnected neural glioma network. So if we break that down, usually you have a neuron synapsing with the next neuron in line to create a signal. But what we've seen now is that the cancer cells can interrupt this pathway and they can receive signals and they can then create the interconnected neural glioma network. Each cancer cell is connected to the next with gap junctions, which makes the cytoplasm of the cells almost continuous, meaning that if a signal is sent to that cancer cell, we can almost be sure that the signal will get to the next cell in line. On top of that, with the electrochemical signaling, we have seen postsynaptic depolarization. In the same way that a neuron sends one action potential creating a signal in the next, we've seen glioma cells depolarize almost in the same manner as any neuron would. And excitatory neurotransmission seems to be cancer promoting. In one study that looked at breast cancer cells which had metastasized to the brain, it was actually shown that on the surface of these cells there was an increase in receptors for neurotransmitters which means that they were developing in a way that would allow them to receive signals from neurons and with that we could have receptor mediated signaling cascades which drive growth and metastasis of tumors. We've also seen similar effects by the peripheral nervous system on cancer in the pancreas, gastric cancers, colon cancers, prostate cancer, breast cancer, oral cancer, and skin cancer. Nonetheless, the way that the nervous system will interact with the cancer is going to depend on where the cancer is. For instance, cholinergic signals are known to be either excitatory or inhibitory, depending on where they are acting. The effect of the signal depends on the location where it's being delivered. For instance, in the pancreas, this cholinergic signal actually inhibits pancreatic adenocarcinoma. However, in the stomach, it promotes adenocarcinoma. Adenocarcinoma is just a cancer of a glandular structure in epithelial tissue, so it would be inhibited by cholinergic signals in the pancreas and promoted by cholinergic signals in the stomach. So far in the periphery, we don't know if there are electrochemical interactions between cells or if it's just paracrine signaling, but we do know that there are interactions occurring. Now, we mentioned the other type of signaling, which is endocrine or systemic signaling, and so we see systemic effects with interactions between the nervous system and cancer. For instance, if we have an increase in catecholamines that are circulating. Catecholamines tend to cause angiogenesis. Angiogenesis is the formation of new blood vessels, and so this can affect cancer growth in the fact that cancer tumor cells may be getting delivery of more nutrients 
and more oxygen, which can promote survival. Now, not only has the nervous system been shown to influence cancer, but cancers have also been shown to influence the nervous system function. We already talked about how cancer cells can insert themselves into the middle of a neural pathway, but with that, we also can have bidirectional crosstalk between cancer and tumor cells meaning we can have influence falling onto the nervous system as well. One thing that gliomas do is cause aberrant synaptogenesis, which is the formation of abnormal synapses. They also increase the excitability of cells and can cause seizures by doing so. On top of that, they end up promoting the activity that will promote their own growth. If cancer cells are increasing the excitability, and excitement of the neurons can cause promotion of cancer growth via glutamatergic pathways, then in a way we have this cycle going on in which the nervous system increases cancer growth and the cancer growth increases signaling sent out by the nervous system, which can just cause a spiral of proliferation. Another thing that has been seen is the proliferation of nerves and axons into the tumor microenvironment. So cancer cells secrete these things called neurotrophins, which help to guide the formation of axons, and so we can have axons which are growing into the tumor. Also, cancer may start to invade the nerves themselves, and so this is called perineural invasion. This can cause chronic pain and remodeling of the nerves. Now, if that's not enough to convince you that there are interactions happening between the nervous system and cancer that we need to consider, there's also the effects that cancer therapies have on the nervous system. For instance, there are long-term deleterious effects of chemotherapy and radiation therapy. If you've ever heard of chemo brain or chemo fog, that's actually known as cancer therapy related cognitive impairment. And it has similar symptoms to concussions with problems with attention, impairments to memory, um, issues multitasking, and even sometimes increases in anxiety. With treatment, we also see peripheral neuropathies. This includes loss of sensation, motor weakness, and pain. So the interactions between the nervous system and cancer are vast. And with that, we should be considering the new emerging field of cancer neuroscience. Hopefully by taking these interactions into account, we can start to develop treatments that target these issues and also might be less detrimental to the nervous system. At the end of the day, the take home message is just that neuroscience is such a deep and diverse field. The research possibilities are really endless. But really the fact that nervous system cells can be communicating to cancer cells is just such a profound discovery and something we need to consider when we develop new therapies to target cancers. That's all for today's video. Thanks for watching. Make sure you do the quiz to test your knowledge. Doing quizzes really helps you retain information. Again, the link is below. The link to the article we talked about today is also down below. And stay tuned for more cancer neuroscience videos as this is the start of a new series. Remember to like this video, comment any questions or anything you want down below. And if you get a chance, check out some of our other videos as well. Thanks for watching. We look forward to seeing you again next week. 